Hello. Hi. Oh, glad to see you, Jennifer. Uh, I am Paul Orselli. Welcome to another museum FAQ video. Um, joining you here. Well, you never tell from the background, but I'm joining you here from uh, POW World Headquarters, Paul Orselli Workshop here on Long Island. And I am definitely delighted to be joined from the far flung other side of North America uh, by Jennifer Martin this morning. Hello, thank you for joining us. Hi, Paul. Uh, so I always like to start out, Jennifer, um, by having people tell us a little bit about their background, because I always think it's interesting to hear how people uh, came to arrive at the place they are now. So why don't you start us out there and then we'll flip into the main conversation. Sure, thank you. Um, well, <clears throat> I have a, I, I'm a kid of the bush. I used to climb around trees and, and you know, catch frogs and, and my email address actually has polywogs in it because it felt like the right place to go back to. Uh, and so I, uh, my undergrad biology, um, when I graduated, there was nothing going on. There was a recession. Um, there was a strike in the, in the city in Sudbury, Ontario, where I was uh, doing my work. And yet down the road was this construction sign that said the future home of the Sudbury Science Centre. And that ultimately became Science North. Uh, I got a summer job there catching snakes and frogs and then we opened and I opened up what's now the, um, the science, uh, nature exchange they call it now. I uh, did a whale skeleton expedition, did some interesting things, but I was in my mid-twenties and got kind of itchy. Went to Toronto to do my MBA, um, which a lot of people were head scratchers about, but um, that comes becomes relevant later. Uh, and worked at the Ontario Science Centre. And I, I think I did about seven different titles as, as I worked through doing my MBA and, and building exhibits, putting on lab coats, doing demonstrations, uh, being a project manager, ultimately to the um, director level, executive level for visitor experience. And the MBA helped me because it, I could speak the language on both sides. I was a content person. I developed exhibits. I did programs, but um, the administrative people and the content people often didn't know how to talk to each other. And I found that I learned the language of accounting and the language of marketing, and, you know, the language of, of organizational development. And so I think that's what helped me through all of that. Uh, we did the Agents of Change at the Ontario Science Centre, which was really a transition from the fundamental interactive exhibit to getting much more tool oriented, much more open concept. Nessie is all get out, challenging culturally, and we can talk a little bit about culture. Uh, and then this opportunity to possibly build a new science center in Calgary came up. So uh, after 20 plus years at the Ontario Science Center, and I've been about five years at Science North before that, I became uh, the CEO at TELUS Park. And uh, it was a little old science center from a planetarium that opened in 1967 and looked needed as the city had grown, needed a brand new facility. So I got to spearhead and, and think, you know, what have we learned over the decades of science centers? How can we be relevant in the community going forward? Uh, we opened in 2011, so it's almost 10 years now. And uh, it was an interesting ride, you know, $150 million project being wanting to be part of the content, but really needing to delegate that to other people. <clears throat> and, and rightly so, it's, you know, it's a different foray to go into a more maker culture, if you will. We didn't call it that, but a lot more um, inquiry-based learning model for that science center. I left there a couple of years ago and I've been doing some freelance CEO work, um, writing, uh, we can talk a little bit about and uh, and in the last little while, you know, trying to help make sense of the world that we're in in this uh, in this period. Well, that's uh, that's uh, that's quite a resume. The the grand tour of some of the the great Canadian science centers there. That's awesome and uh, equally awesome as a as a fellow biology person. Uh, I, I I was wondering about your email address being polywog, so that's I learned something new right there. Well, um, I think you are the perfect person, given your experience, both on the management side and 
your experience on the content side and your academic background and interest on the biological side to sort of knit those threads together and leap into a conversation related to managing through transition, which what a timely topic <laughs> that is right now when we're when we are uh, uh, filming this video, uh, of course, COVID-19 and uh, economic issues worldwide and racial and social equity issues, all sorts of things related to uh, the world, both inside and outside museums. But um, of course, I'm sure you can attest, uh, museums may always be in transition in some way or another, things are going on. <laughs> So I'd, I'd really be interested, I know you've written some things recently, but certainly your experience and expertise uh, to really um, give folks who are watching this video um, some takeaways or some things that really come to the top of your mind when you're thinking about helping managing through transition and not just the institutional side, but the human side of transition, because obviously, these sorts of events have a big impact on staff and visitors and the communities we serve uh, beyond just the institutional aspects of transitions. So I gave you, I gave you a gigantic meatball that I lobbed over the net there. So you can hack off a, a starting piece wherever you like. <laughs> okay. Um, well, let me, let me back up a little bit and put a second word in there, which is change. Um, you know, there's everything from change happens to us, to um, those of us, and I've been that kind of um, disruptor, not always in a positive way, but um, change disruptor in organizations. We could do this, we can go there, you know, kind of pushing the boundaries. Um, there's change, and, and in management terms, we talk about change management, like we can actually do that. Um, I, I tend to think you can lead change, um, but it's not the change that's the problem. Change, um, and in fact, I'm going to reference William Bridges wrote a great book in the early 90s called Managing Transitions. And Bridges talks about the difference between change, which he says is situational. You go from this state to this state. Um, you're this kind of museum and you want to become that kind of museum. Great. So you've got this destination and you're going from A to B. But transition is a much more psychological uh, issue. It's the response to the change. And he said, we, we don't think about what happens in that kind of wave movement that goes from being in one place and needing to get to another. They're early adopters, and I tend to be one of those types. And so that's part of my challenge is, is being too focused on the future, not realizing other people are responding. So uh, Bridges Transitions has helped me a lot. And he says, there are really three things that happen in a change. Um, there's a there's a letting go of the end. There's an ending. Like you really begin with an ending. You have to say and honor that things the way they were are stopping. They're dying, they're ending, we're leaving them behind. And that's pretty hard and emotional for some people because they could be very invested in that, right? How do we, you know, how do we uh, always have this conversation in museums and science centers about, oh, we just can't stop that program. We, we can't learn how to turn things off. It's because we've got humans invested in those things and, and they don't want to let that go. And, you know, maybe rightly so. So there's this got to honor that. And then there's a period in between, which he calls the neutral zone, which is really interesting language because you could see neutral as, well, some people will see this middle ground as positive. It can be very creative. The rules have kind of let go. You can try stuff. But other people see it as negative, and that's because they don't know what the rules are anymore. Everything's changed under their feet. And this transition is a very unsettling experience for them. So they can act out. They can be the troublemakers when you're trying to get to that new place. And it's not that they don't want to go there. It's they're just feeling alienated uh, in the process. And then this third phase is getting to the new change. And of course, once you're there, You've got a whole bunch of things you've got to figure out. Um, so when I when we opened uh, Telespark, for instance, um, we got there, um, and I can go back and talk about the things I learned, kind of in reflection after the fact about that transition, that human quality. But we got there, and suddenly, 
like the doors are open and people are coming in. You don't know where the bathrooms are and something's different. And, you know, it's like a startup. And it is um, a brand new facility. Even though you've been a science center, you're still a science center, you're a brand new thing. So you can get to the destination and still be bouncing. Um, and so the change is going from old to new, maybe in this case, but the human psychological transition is something that we don't tend to think enough about. We get frustrated by as leaders, we wonder why people aren't following, why they're disrupting. We wonder why they're crying in their lunch. Um, and it's, it's because it is an emotional thing. So stepping back and using that framework is I think really helpful as we go through this. Now that was an example of making change. Goodness knows right now we're experiencing change. Um, and I think that's also a, a key thing for us to remember. I think we've, because the pandemic has done such a personal um, thing to everybody, as well as a professional piece, I think we're a little more aware of the, the human transition elements, the emotional elements. But at the same time, you know, thinking about the ending of one thing, the uncertainty in the middle and the starting of something new is, is not a bad way to help us sort out and analyze what the heck is going on today. Oh, yeah, definitely. So um, I'm always interested when um, the conversation uh, veers towards uh, this, this sort of um, aspect, managing change, thinking about transition. Uh, but yeah, I was struck by something you mentioned. There, there is sort of this constant tug and pull, maybe all the time in museums, between this sort of comfort level and there are there are known rules and this this uh, you know reaching for the future and moving to new things and how to balance those because uh, as you mentioned there are people who are the the pioneers the ones who are like okay let's go here let's let's try this uh, we can do anything and then there are people who are like ooh wait a second I, you know i'm I understand why we're doing this, but I, I need a certain level of surety. I need a, a mm -hmm. certain comfort level that we're not moving too fast. And that, that just seems like human nature. So I'm wondering, um, as a manager, as somebody who m might be guiding change and transition, um, how, how you balance those sort of, those sort of, I don't want to say competing exactly, but those, those sort of, uh, both, both sides of the coin in terms of uh, certain certain aspects that we really want to have clear rules of engagement and clear foundations, and then other times when we we really do need to let go and and move forward into the unknown. Yeah, you know, I wonder uh, if if things like I know we don't use this tech, uh, this terminology much anymore, but the old skunk works language. Um, there are certain people who will, uh, when you say we're, we're going to a new place, they're there instantly. Um, they may have gone through some of this, but they've, they've wanted to leave behind. They wanted to end the way things were. They, could, they were dissatisfied. Um, and, and then there are, you know, honestly, they're the people who are going to get left behind because they can't develop the skills we need to get to to be operating, to be functional and effective people and, and the other. And, and, but I think that's a pretty small number. I, my experience at the Ontario Science Centre when we were going through the Agents of Change um, program, the Western Family Innovation Centre was, was the big outcome of that, was that we needed to change the language. That was the only way that I could help to illustrate what it was because putting a vision together and trying to illustrate it and say, oh, you're going to have fun there. It's good. It's important, but um, but I remember the guys in the in the shops at the Ontario Science Center. There's a mass of shops, great, amazing cabinet makers, metalsmiths. All of I mean, we were blessed with the capacity there. And then, and I said, well, you know, we're going to be doing experiences, and visitors will become participants. This was uh, late late '90s, early 2000s. And one of the guys in the wood shop looked at me. He said, I don't know how to build an experience. I build exhibits. <laughs> and you know I went oh right you know what I, I've I've framed a, a to b but I haven't acknowledged that they they need to come along 
they need to understand. So we tried to do a lot of prototyping work with them. We tried to say, look, multiple people will be engaged with this experience, even though it looks like an exhibit. It's, it's more of an open tabletop than it is a digital or a physical uh, one person. The, the, Jerry Krauss, the, the former head of design at the Ontario Science Center many years ago said, a rather derogatory way, he said, we build vending machines. You know, you put your dollar in, you get the same can of Coke out every time. That's what old model exhibits were in his view. It's not entirely true. He was being a little um, hyperbolic, but, but it's right. When, you, when you're not sure what the outcomes are going to be uh, for visitors, you have to remember your, your, your staff, your team also is unsure. And some love that and some don't have the skills for it. So it's also part of, I think, the transition to give people a chance to practice new things, to fail at them, to kind of have that open culture of experimentation um, and, and try things. I mean, we talk about it in exhibit development all the time. Well, how do you actually inculcate that all the way up into the organization? Uh, so Julie Bowen, who I worked with at, at uh, Spark, she would get the accounting team down to do prototyping. Now, it wasn't it was more pilot testing, it was concept uh, work. It wasn't actual mechanical prototyping, but it really helped them understand what the heck we were doing. And if your accounting team doesn't get it, um, if they don't feel part of the culture, if they're rule bound and you've got this crazy group that's throwing mud against the wall, internally it's gonna rub somewhere. Um, because somebody in the programs team is going to want to order something weird and the accounting team is going to put a stop on that and weeks go by before you realize what's happened. You know, they're very simple things that can happen in, a, in an organization that can really foul you up. It's tricky and I would imagine too, it seems the, the larger the organization, the, sometimes the easier it is to get into our little groups and our boxes and, and that. I, it's interesting. I, I had an opportunity to to visit uh, Huttinger uh, Fabricators in Germany, mm -hmm. and uh, they have been doing something that's apropos to this, you know, taking their whole team on, on like a field trip, like a weekend field trip yeah. to visit museums, you know, and guys in the shop and the counting people and, you know, but ju just to say, you know, here's the business we're in you see we're playing with these we're we're mixing it up with other visitors whether you're in accounting or whether you're a welder or whether you're an exhibit developer you know we're all part of this ecosystem that's contributing to visitors coming here to enjoy themselves and to learn things and to be with other people and i i think that i th i mean i just thought that was great you know, uh, that they took the time and the, to say, okay, we really want everybody, everybody has a role, but you're also part of this bigger picture, so. Yes, well, so, I'd like to think, we worked with the uh, Hüttinger, so uh, on Telespark, so I'd like to think they might have learned a little bit from us on that one. I'll, I'll, I'll next time I see Axel, I'll ask him about that. You so, do that. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, we, we talked a little bit about uh, staff and uh, some people feeling like, well, this is <laughs> maybe the worst thing you want to hear as a manager, like, well, why are we doing this? Well, because we've always done it this way. Um, you know, there's a comfort level in that, but also in our visitors, especially, you know, places like Science North or the Ontario Science Center, um, you know, where people went there as kids and then are bringing their kids and they're like, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 what do you mean you're changing my science center? I mean, how, how do you, how, how did you, or how do you think about that too? The, the, the especially in a long lived, well loved museum. You know, that, that's, oh, that's, I stepped in it on that one. Let me tell you, um, not so much at the Ontario Science Center because we've done, uh, what was it, about 15,000 square feet of change inside 100,000 square feet of exhibition space. So, you know, it was, a, it was a, an edge of the wedge of change um, with the Innovation Center. But I took that concept and the work that we did and applied it to an entire new science center when I came to Calgary. 
And I missed those opportunities for transition with the audience. And we got hit hard by some people in the community. I failed to bring the memory of the old Science Centre to the new. Our, our best example is the bed of nails. We'd have, you know, the old bed of nails with all the multi-points and, you know, that lifts up. And um, it's usually a physics demonstration of, of spreading mass over many small sharp points and it, it's okay. Um, no, we're not doing the bed of nails. We're not doing it. And I mean, it became kind of a rallying cry for the team. You're not doing that kind of exhibit experience. So when the visitors came in, they were looking, half of them, I don't know if it was 50%. Where's the bed of nails? Where's, Where's the, the bed of nails? nails? Where's, I heard the same thing when the Exploratorium moved. I was sitting on a plane uh, next to somebody on the plane who said, I don't know if I like the new place. They took away the chick hatchery. And it was like you throw the entire thing out because one memorable exhibit is missing. So um, we failed to think about the emotional transition for our audience because we're so focused on this is where we need to go. People need to have more open-ended learning, thinking with your hands, you know, all of that sort of not giving them answers, getting more questions. And I can't tell you how many I had this one mom whose nine-year-old son was looking at her sheepishly. She was angry. Like I was the CEO standing down at the, at the uh, entry exit. And one of my staff pointed to me and said, go talk to her. Uh, and the mom just stripped one up and down. Me. Oh, I thought we were going to learn about climate change when we came here. Blah, 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 and solar panels and everything else. And there was an exhibit that was little square solar panels they used a light cannon in each one of them. So it was a, an array of, uh, it was probably 15 by 10 of these little panels. And every one you hit did a different tune. So boop, 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 boop. You know, and if you kind of got the pattern, you might actually be able to make sense. She was livid. That was not a good exhibit. And I, so I ultimately could say, you know, you see the doors you're about to leave? If I could have measured your son's curiosity coming in, and his level of curiosity going out, that exhibit might have got him thinking about other uses for solar panels. And I would like to think that the dial moved and she went, ah, got it. Now, I couldn't talk to every visitor like that who was upset with us. And the bed of nails um, was kind of like that vending machine, right? You could do one thing with it. Well, ultimately, about three, maybe four years after opening, we got a bed of nails. Finally, you know, I went back to the team because I knew. I knew we needed it. I knew because of the memory, people had raised their kids in the old building. Even though it was gnarly, dirty, kind of, you know, dark old place, they loved it because of those emotional associations. And I didn't end it well there. We didn't end the old science center. We just abandoned it. Um, we didn't think about the uncertainty period in the neutral zone. And then we had our hands full with the, okay, we're open and, and things are going left, right, center. Now, let me say the other half, if you will, of the audience totally loved what we did. Our membership numbers went way out. They understood, they liked this. They liked that their kids could take apart electronics and pull the little motors out of an old CD player and spin it up with, uh, you know, connecting the uh, batteries to it, all that sort of stuff they loved. So the bed and nails came back, but it came back in a very different way. In our being human hall, which we were told by the audience in early research work before we built exhibits, that's where we worked with Hüttinger, um, it was about being human. It was much more about communication and relationship, talking with your hands as, as I do, you know, how expressive we can be. I'm sure there were things like stop motion jumping experiences and, and whatnot. The bed of nails ended up there framed in risk is this something you would try you know and it ended up with these conversations of people talking about were they afraid of getting on it the kids were getting on their mom come on you tried oh no i'm not sure you know that's the kind of experience that i'm a big fan of getting people talking with each other asking questions wondering lifting the social engagement so suddenly the bed and nails went from oh yeah go do it get off it i remember it to a much more engaging experience. So context was important. But, you know, for not thinking about Bridges transitions at the time, um, we, we made some, we made a number of audience members pretty unhappy and we yeah. had to go back and help fix that.
Yeah, that's uh, that. But that's a great example. The bed of nails uh, that you were still able to bring this this sort of powerful memory, but you did add a little new twist to it. You did provide a, maybe a little additional context uh, that that uh, sort of honored both the old and the new. That's that's the constant museum conundrum, isn't it? As an exhibits yeah. person, people. People, you know, they complain to us. They want to see new things, but don't don't take away any of the old oh, things. Yeah. So it's like, well, <laughs> the, the clever expanding building that we have here that can just completely continue adding new things and not take away any of the old things. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that's a uh, that's that's tough. But I think, um, as you've been mentioning all along, how to be cognizant of those emotional connections, which we want people to have emotional and social ties to museum experiences, not just press the button or stick their finger in a socket and get a shock. That, that, that's, that, that's not the only aspect of things. Yeah. So, um, yeah. well, I'm wondering if uh, I, I, I like, I really like um, the bed of nails. Uh, example. I'm wondering if um, <clears throat> there are any other uh, examples in your uh, grand circle tour of the Canadian <laughs> Science Center world that that strike you as instructive or or things for people to latch on to um, as they're thinking about their own situations and navigating changes and transitions in the museum world. Well, you know, I um, I don't have as much practical experience with this. Uh, just thinking about how many of our museums have gone virtual because of the shutdown. Uh, and I'm reading, and maybe I'm going to be postulating more than providing an example, but <clears throat> there was an interesting piece that came out. Um, I think someone from NPR had written about, you know, the Police Touch Museum and all those places that are named hands-on. Yeah, named the Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum. Yeah. And, <laughs> and the death of that, you know, that sort of metaphorical or this is going to be a real problem for them. I disagree. I really, I mean, humans are humans. And, and this is actually one thing that I'm, I'm really passionate about, about the tactility of the human experience. Um, there's some really strong neuroscience that says, you know what, if you give kids tools when they're little, their brain wiring, their neurologic development actually works in a way that they understand three-dimensional concepts better, things like vectors. Oh my gosh, now we're talking math. And one of the suppositions about why it is that girls have seemed to have not done so well in, in mathematics and in, in primary grades is because they weren't given that opportunity to work with their hands in the same way. Now, my grandmother taught me how to knit. That was one thing, but I literally just put a new tube and tire on one of our bicycles because I've been doing that since, you know, forever. Um, and um, that kind of actual engagement is critical, I think, to the human condition. So this issue of, you know, no touching anything, we'll get past that. And we have to, because it's critical to the way our brains work. And it's critical to our children's development. Um, I, you know, we, we had it at Spark, at a tabletop set up, um, literally with screwdrivers and pliers. Now, because there's a children's museum within Spark, um, it's called the Creative Kids Museum, it's an exhibit hall, but um, it's framed as a children's museum. And so you've got, you know, it sets up mentally for that. Well, now you've got two and three year olds who, of course they come out of there into the rest of the building and they get upstairs and there's pliers and screwdrivers and their parents were starting to have a bit of a, you know, fit about that. You could, it's like, oh my God, no, you can't let my kids near those tools. Um, the team did a fabulous job. And you know, we argue all the time about how much time we spend on graphics and nobody ever reads them. Well, they did it, they did it right. It was a very simple frame. It showed up about four or five times. It was just vinyl, stuck it up, and it had sort of black with chalkboard type writing on it. It said, real tools develop real skills. And then underneath, you may need to supervise your child more closely here. And suddenly that, noise about tools and safety dropped 
because of signs. So, uh, but also, you know, our facilitators kind of got a better lingo in, in this business about her neural ad, neurologic development and everything else that started to weave through. Sometimes so, the easiest way to fix an exhibit experience is to change the label. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you so, know, I, I was going to say, I couldn't agree with you more about, I mean, we need to, of course, be mindful and respectful of people's legitimate health concerns and maybe even their fears uh, about coming into museums. But the notion of a so-called contactless museum or a totally touchless museum seems like uh, just vaulting years into the past in a negative way. I, 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 I agree with everything you said about that. I, I think, you know, again, this is this balance. How are we mindful and respectful of our visitors' legitimate concerns, but also providing a, a deep and meaningful experience for visitors too, you know, and not just, well, <laughs> Here's here's your new museum experience. We've 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 put everything away that you can touch, and we've added more uh, hand sanitizer stations. That like that doesn't seem like a great pitch to me, but no, not at, not at this stage. Um, you know, we we had uh, when I was at the Ontario Science Center, we had to deal with SARS, uh, and just to <clears throat> briefly touch on that. It, it, as this pandemic has turned out, that was an epidemic and it was very localized and Toronto was one of those, uh, was the North American epicenter and, and painted with a pretty harsh brush. Um, but we never closed the Ontario Science Centre. We made all the things that people are doing now in their, in their museums and science centres, putting out hand sanitizers. That was an unknown thing in 2005. Um, but uh, it, it it didn't change the behavior back then because it, the SARS got isolated into the hospital system. So it was contained pretty quickly. It was horrible and there were other problems in, in Asia and more people died there. This is a different thing that affects all of our lives. Um, and yet we will adapt. That's the thing about humans is that we're very adaptable. Um, it's just back to that transitions model. Um, we have to remember that we have to let go of the way things were because we won't go back to that. But where we can go to can be pretty exciting. And I think that's um, a massive motivator for me to think about what museums and science centers can be as we move forward. Um, this is certainly shaking us up, no question. But, you know, once in a while, <laughs> I hate maybe, to say it. In, maybe we in, can in use some shaking up. <laughs> we, could, we could. Now, you know, not respecting that people are losing their jobs in museums, and, and this is for people's professions a really, really tough time. Um, but there's, it's not something we did to ourselves. So, you know, own that, move on, and let's, let's see what we can do next. Well, I, I think that's a perfect place to end to, to uh, again, be mindful of people's legitimate concerns and the, the place that we're coming from, but to, to be legitimately optimistic and to look at the opportunities that, uh, that potentially the future can hold if, if, we, if we want to uh, look at things in that way. Well, uh, Jennifer, I, I, again, I really appreciate you taking the time today. As, as I mentioned before, uh, we started recording. We will we will provide references and links in the description below, as they say. And I think uh, that, that you know uh, ways for people to find out more about you and your work, but also uh, references like the the book you you referenced uh, and and maybe some of your articles and and related links and references. So great. Uh, thank thanks again. Uh, always always nice to to see you and speak with you great to see you paul thanks so much for this it was a great chat take care bye-bye